All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Before we dive in today's episode, I want to thank you for tuning in and supporting the brand. Over the last few years, I spent a lot of time starting Farmer Grade. We offer meat that you and your family can trust by strictly sourcing our cuts from farmers who share their story and processes online through social media. We provide high quality beef and pork that is 100% born, raised, and harvested in the United States. If you want to support the content and the message we share online, I would appreciate it if you went over to farmergrade.com and you can use the code BARNTALK to save 10% off your next order. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. We love you. Now, let's get into the episode. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays in the barn, but not today. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today is going to be a Q&A episode. These are the questions that you guys have submitted through barntalkshow at gmail.com. That's where you can email us your questions for these kinds of episodes. Uh, we got a good lineup here, mostly to do with ag. It's kind of how it rolls on our Q and A episodes. But we got we're getting close to the new year, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about our goals, some of the stuff we've accomplished, maybe light a fire under your asses. I don't know. We'll see where we go with it. Um, but before we get into it, you guys know the drill: share the show. The more that you guys do that, the more that this show grows. The better guests we can get on, uh, the more content we can make. And it's kind of the ticket to admission to watch or listen to the show. Uh, we appreciate every single one of you guys that do that, whether it's telling your neighbor, whether it's telling somebody at a bar, telling somebody that you know in person, or sharing it online, sending it through text, whatever. Everything helps. Uh, you can also leave a review on Spotify or Apple. Uh, we're up to 2,000 five star reviews on Spotify, and uh, we are at almost, we're getting close to 1,000 on Apple. Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on YouTube and watch us there for the video version of the podcast. Check us out on TikTok. Check us out on Instagram. We're on all platforms at Barn Talk or Barn Talk Show. Um, so, yeah, Dad, how are you feeling? Feeling good. Optimistic. Yeah. New year, new opportunities. Forget about all the trash that I didn't do very well last year. You know, don't look back. Just look yeah. forward. Yeah. When is the new year? We're actually not in January yet at the time we're recording this, but... Monday. Monday's the New Year, huh? Monday's New Year's Eve, I think. New Year's Eve. No, Sunday's New Year's Eve. Monday's New Year's Day. Yeah. So by the time the fine folks get this... Yep, it'll be a New Year. So... 2024. We're going to get you fired up for it. I'm going to do a... I'm going to do a market update today. We're going to have a Whiskey Minute today. I'm actually pretty excited for the Whiskey Minute because uh, the bottle I have, it's it's like... It's top good. shelf, huh? Is it top shelf? Uh, no, but it's uh, cousins to top shelf, and it's really interesting. I'll get into some whiskey geekdom. So they better listen or watch the episode oh, yeah, all the stay way through, all the way to the end, because that's that's when the good stuff is. And uh, yeah, we'll do a market update. Uh, I'm I'm all amped up. I've got my uh, adult heroin drink from Triple M Nutrition, uh, blueberry. There's no commodity market for, I'm sorry, blue raspberry. There's no commodity market for blue raspberry. It's the greatest flavor that God never invented. I don't know who came up with the idea of blue raspberry, but I love it. You think people actually think you're drinking heroin or are you going to explain? No, it's just, uh, it's an, it's like a, it's one of these, what, what are they? These have popped up everywhere. They're like a nutrition store that throws in caffeine and good supplements for you to get yeah, they have all different kinds of drinks. Teas. Collagen in it. You can get all kind. You can't actually get heroin in it. It probably just has a lot of caffeine in it. Yeah. It's like a pre, I think it's like pre-workout in it. Yeah. Is, yeah. Anyway, I already worked out for the day, but uh, they're just, they're pretty good. I probably have one more often than I should. I try to limit myself to once a week, but uh, we're not quite Sometimes there. you need a kick. Yeah. I thought today, you know, you'd want the best of me. So yeah. I got one. And you're getting it now. You're getting it now. I'm going to give you the market update. Uh, fresh, fresh market update, courtesy of Cat's Grain in Washington, Iowa. Uh, I'm thankful that our good friend John Griner at Cat's Grain did not get tackled to the ground by uh, Ron DeSantis's security detail because he brought us a little Christmas present uh, while we were shooting that podcast. And 
he showed up with a brown paper bag that was stapled shut, and uh, the security guys kind of gave him the, the hairy eyeball and made him leave it outside. So, but all that was in it was some Captain Morgan and some pina, eggnog. Eggnog, yep. yeah. So no bombs, nothing like that. It was all good. All good. Anyway, he has good intentions. He did have good. He did, John has good intentions for all of you out there that need somebody to. Uh, to either tell you what to do with your marketing program or dream up a new marketing program or just, hell, just tell him what you're doing and tell him, John, I just want you to tell me that I'm doing the right thing. He can do that there. And they can do as little for you or as much. Cat's grain. So, uh, corn 477 uh, on the board, 469 local. Apparently, all the hog feeders got the bins about full because there's not really a hot, no hot grain bids around uh, our neck of the woods. Cedar Rapids, 485, and that's for December corn, so you better get it in there because the week's about done. Uh, beans, 1317, uh, 1295 at the river, 1338 on the other side of the river. Bean mill, 394 a ton. Wheat has popped back up again, uh, 633. Hogs, trash, <laughs> still trash. Uh, can't stay over $70, 6930. For the, I think that's the December contract too. That might be the G. Uh, I, not sure on that. I didn't write it down. Uh, wiener pigs, still like thirty bucks. So your average sow unit costs, you know, forty two, forty five dollars to make a wiener pig, and the market's about thirty. So uh, no bueno. Cattle <laughs> one seventy, feeder cattle two twenty three, oil seventy three dollars, and OPEC got together and they agreed to cut uh, a million barrels of oil. And I don't think it matters because it hasn't really affected the market that much. And uh, the Houthi, the Houthi rebels from Yemen are still firing missiles uh, in the Suez Canal. And everybody thought that was really going to drive up oil prices. It hasn't really seemed to. The U.S. and its coalition of everybody else uh, is keeping the, the canal open I think freight prices, though, might very well go up because something like, I want to say 70% of the trade that goes between uh, Asia and Europe goes through the Suez Canal. And if anybody's firing off anything in that part of the world, the insurance companies won't insure the, the ships. So a lot of them are going around the horn, the horn of good hope in South Africa. And so it adds about 20% to the travel time anyway we'll see how that all plays out but oil 73 bucks bitcoin forty two thousand five hundred dollars uh we're still in crypto spring yeah i think raul's on to something there. yep absolutely ethereum twenty three hundred and seventy two dollars tesla two hundred and fifty nine dollars gold two thousand eighty six silver twenty two dollars not that it matters uh one interesting business thing that happened this last week uh adobe who makes the wonderful, wonderful software that helps us edit the podcast that makes us sound semi-professional. Because uh, this wouldn't happen without Adobe Premiere. God, you you plug more people than... Which, Jesus, we, we should be getting some dollars from your plug in here. Well, Adobe should be paying us, but they ain't got any money because yeah. <laughs> they were going to try to buy this company called Figma, which Figma... I, I want to say Figma wasn't public. I think they were trying to go public, and then Adobe offered them $20 billion to buy it, and uh, that deal all fell apart last week. But kudos to Figma because as part of the deal, they made, they made part of the deal be that if the deal fell apart, Adobe had to pay them a billion dollars, and Adobe agreed to that. So they get a they get a billion dollars just for basically putting themselves up for sale and having it fall through. So I like a deal like that. Yeah, that's, but that's finding free money. Uh it's I think there's a lot of I think all this banking turmoil turmoil that we saw last year and uh just a tightening in the amount of venture capital out there has really hurt uh the the M and A business and the the venture capital business. So there's two other deals that fell apart last week that we're not going to talk about. But um, a lot of people have been talking that 24 is going to be a piss poor year as far as companies 
going public and uh, companies buying other things because there's a lack of liquidity in the in the venture capital market. So that's something to watch. Uh, hey, I think that's all I got. Yeah, well, that was a good one. Uh, I'm not saying Adobe isn't good and we shouldn't plug them because it's pretty much Final Cut or Adobe Premiere. And we use Adobe Premiere. And the reason we chose Adobe Premiere and why we learned, why we use that to edit all our stuff is there's more YouTube tutorials out there on Adobe Premiere than there are Final Cut. So <clears throat> if you're looking to f learn how to edit, that's my recommendation, Adobe Premiere. But no, no money coming to Barn Talk for Adobe. But you're just you're, you're just very kind today. Well, yeah, I'm, it's it's the Christmas spirit, New Year spirit. Uh, I don't. They don't owe us anything. We don't owe them anything. But hey, their shit works. I learned to edit. Yep. I probably forgot most of it now. Uh, God bless Cat. Uh, because she does it all, and if I had to go back to doing it, I'd probably... The podcast struggle. probably wouldn't get out every week like but it does now. Just the fact that I could learn to do it is a testimony to how good the tutorials are yep. and your patience. Yep, there you go. 100%. There you go. Well, I think we're going to get into it, guys, but before we get into like the questions that you guys submitted, we just wanted to kind of go over our last episode. We appreciate every single one of you guys that have said, you know, it's awesome that you guys got DeSantis on. Congratulations. But we also got a lot of people that are giving us a bunch of flack and a lot of shit for it. And haters are going to hate no matter who you have on or what you do. But we just want to make it known to you guys, we're not endorsing any one candidate. Like, having DeSantis on the show wasn't us saying that we're for DeSantis 100%. We reached out to his team months ago. They got back to us. And we just want to have a conversation with them. And we're open to doing that with any candidate on either side. We are open to it. If they want to come to Southeast Iowa, sit in this chair across from us, and have a conversation about how they're going to turn things around for this country, we want to give them a platform to do it and talk to the American people. So we're not, you know, we've seen the comment people telling us that we're sellouts. We didn't get anything from that besides having a presidential candidate come here and chop it up with us in the barn. And it was an absolute honor. It was awesome. And it's all a testament to you guys giving us your support and sharing the show and get the word out. Because if we didn't have that credibility, that opportunity probably would have not come. So um, just wanted to throw that out there. You know, we're, we're open to anybody coming on the show if we can just get them on here and get them down to Southeast Iowa. So Yeah, only one disclaimer. Uh, to come on the show, if you are a if you are a candidate, you do have to be able to make your way up the spiral staircase. So I'm just saying, <laughs> and, and this isn't, I'm not bagging on any particular uh, person running for office, but if you are so feeble or if you get lost easily, you know, like if you, it's a pretty big open area. Or fall asleep easily. And there are farm animals. And, you know, if, if, you, if you have trouble wandering off or you can't climb a spiral staircase, Probably won't. Probably, probably can't. Won't. Yeah, we probably can't get you on. Yeah. Other than that, <laughs> if you're generally healthy and have your wits about you, you are more than welcome to come on the podcast. Yeah. So I, just I like that, that tie in. There. Yeah, that's a good disclaimer. We definitely don't want any liabilities on our part. No, because <laughs> Lord knows we are. In, we're actually going to talk about insurance yeah. today, and uh, don't bother thinking you're going to get a going to get a settlement out of us because we ain't got anything anyway. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I was really surprised. I made the comment to Sawyer that uh, you know when we have a when we have a podcast that we kind of talk about a hot button issue like an ag, like if we're talking about a lot of times when we've talked about fertility or no till or equipment or this or that, you know, there you get people that <laughs> message us and like you guys are totally wrong and you're doing it wrong and you're crazy and this and that and that's all fine, but holy shit! Political people, the Twitter, whoo, they are cutthroat. And if you are not 100% drinking the Kool Aid for whoever they're about, they are going to let you have it. And uh, I was like, damn, boys, you know, we just, we just sat down and had a conversation with the man. We're not, uh, we're not endorsing him. And uh, I'd say that, yeah, neither one of us are, uh, Neither one of us are diehard uh, Ron DeSantis uh, people, but 
Uh, we just wanted to have him on. And, and I'll be honest, I thought he did a great job. I thought that he was prepared and he had good answers. And I think a lot of what he said I could agree with. Uh, I think the problems that I had with him before he was on, I think I probably still have those. I still have those um, issues, but I think I think there's a hell of a lot worse people out there that we could end up with as president. But um, you That's know, there fact. may be some better ones. That's my exact thoughts as well. Uh, I don't give a shit as long as the person get the job done, yeah. and I feel like he's got a pretty good track record of what he's done in Florida. Uh, he seems like he's an executor of getting stuff done yeah. rather than talking and being polarizing. And I think he's more of an action taker. And um, I don't know what it'd look like if he got elected president, but from what he's done, it seems like he could do some shit if he did get elected president. But I think, I think the Santis, Trump, or Vivek, either one of those guys, I think one might have a better impact on the state of America than the than others, but. Either one of those guys got it. Got it. I think we'd get in a better position there where you, than where we're at right now. Absolutely. And so uh, that's that's my two cents. And I'd love to have Vic or Trump on the show. I mean, if we got Trump on the show, that'd be insane. But yeah. um, I'd love to talk to either one of those guys and ask them same kind of things and see yeah. what their responses are. But uh, yeah, no doubt, it's 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 just insane to think that we've come to this point and that i mean when we started this podcast the reason we named it we didn't name it this will do farm podcast or whistler family farm podcast or whatever is because yeah we are known as farmers guys we like talking about farming it's what we do every day but we felt like we had an opportunity to if we did call it barn talk we're not putting ourselves inside of a box of just being able to talk about egg it's shot in a barn. Yes, we're farmers, but we can talk about more than just farming. And so I'm so glad that we did that because I don't think we would have ever had Ron DeSantis on the show yeah. or Marshall Yonda on the show if we were narrowed ourselves in that box. So uh, I, I want to have a lot more interesting guests on from different industries. So it's not just going to be ag, but anyway... That's yeah, all that one, we'll say about it. One last observation. <laughs> Anybody that saw the picture of the three of us standing outside the barn, Sawyer, me, and Ron DeSantis, uh, I thought it, I thought it was very funny, the people that are that just going on about him being short and wearing platform boots, because if you see that picture, if there's anyone in that picture that needs platform shoes, uh, it's this guy. Because I look like a circus midget standing next to you, <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't know. Ron might be short, but I look like I look like I'm a 12 year old kid standing out there. So anyway, uh, put me in touch with whoever is making those fancy uh, black platform boots. Uh, what else should we talk about? You want to do some questions, or do you want to talk about? I think some we do want to do. I want. I think we do. We do questions, and then we'll do observations at the end. Okay. People want some value. We've we've been running for seventeen minutes here. People are probably getting pissed. Shut the fuck up, Sawyer and Torque. Get into so it. So we we hit or do we hit the the DeSantis question or do you want to touch on that that Caden sent us? What candidate are we backing in twenty twenty four? Yep. And why? Yep. <sighs> yeah. Well, and this is back to people are going to give you shit no matter what. Yeah. So I'm for Trump. I'll yeah. just say it. I'm for Trump. I'm not afraid to say it. I think Trump. To me, it's like we've talked about on this podcast before. Um, if you are against the establishment and the establishment is doing everything that they can to literally not have you run because they're fucking afraid that you're going to go against their agenda and destroy everything that they're trying to do, which if you look around, it's destroying America and what we stand for. Uh yeah, I want that guy to go fight. Right. And especially with the track record that he has. Yeah, you might not like what comes out of his fucking mouth, but does he get the job done and were we in a better spot than where we are today? That's the question you need to ask yourself. I don't care. I don't care what comes out of his mouth. He was he he had respect not only from people in this country, but from foreign leaders. People respected him and he got shit done and the country was thriving and you can't take that away from him. And so I think we need to get back to that. And I think he's already been in there. 
He knows he knows the opposition, and he's had time to reflect and know how to come up with a game plan. And I think he can turn shit around real quick because he's done it before. Yeah. Do I think he can run for eight years? No. That's where a candidate like DeSantis might be a better option because he could run for eight years, I think. And I think we could get a lot of shit changed in eight years and like really change and stay changed for eight, if he ran for eight years. But um, yeah, I and I'll also say Vivek, and I know this isn't very popular with a bunch of people. And some people think they can't, you know, they, they look at him and they're like, he came out of nowhere. Can you trust him? Can you not? Some people still say that. But what he says on the debate stage, what he's doing on the campaign trail, what what he's coming out of his mouth, yeah, he's polarizing. He's kind of a little bit like Trump in the fact he's not afraid to say what needs to be said and what an American people are actually thinking at home. Yeah. And that, the shit that's coming out of his mouth is also anti-establishment, Yeah, which I look at and I go, that yields trust for me because- when I look at you and you're saying shit that everybody's thinking, but nobody in the big media or nobody in politics or nobody in the Congress wants to say or talk about and wants to lie to us about, and you say that, that makes me feel like you're in touch with how people are actually, what they're actually thinking about at home. Yeah. And, and you're really trying to fight for the American people, not get your pockets lined with cash or whatever the, else, the, hell, whatever the hell else they're trying to grease you with. And so I lean towards candidates that are going against establishment and are not afraid to, to voice that opinion of going against establishment. Yeah. Cause I think ultimately my opinion, I think the establishment at this point really is taking us to a bad place. And sometimes I question, do they have the American people's best interest in mind? I don't think I can add a lot to that. I mean, I think I, I feel the same way. Um, I think the question that I asked DeSantis about uh, suburban voters, mostly, I think it's mostly suburban women that are probably the biggest hurdle to Trump getting reelected. However, I think the difference is this time over last time, I think even they realize that things have changed dramatically in their own lives since the last election. The last election, everything was going really, really well, and they were really tired of listening to his divisive crap come out of his mouth, and they didn't like his tone, and they didn't like all that, and they voted against him. I think this time, those same people that voted against him, a lot of them are in a lot worse shape economically than what they were, or maybe they're not in any worse shape economically. However, their feeling of security and optimism and what they think the future is, I feel like is in a lot worse spot than what it was uh, four years ago, three years ago. Um, and I think that's going to make a difference. And I'm with you. I have no, if you've listened to us for any amount of time, I think you probably know that I'm one of those people that I do not trust the government. I don't like politicians. I think that they are all severely out of touch with their constituents. And I don't think we're told the truth. And I think they're heavily manipulated by money and lining their own pockets and taking care of their own and the favors that they have promised people to get to where they are. And that's on both sides of the aisle. And I don't, so the, the candidate that I think has absolutely emerged in my mind that is the worst, and I, I feel bad about it because when Nikki Haley was at the UN, I really liked her. But I feel like today she's 100% bought and paid for by the establishment. Military industrial complex. She is funded by BlackRock. She is in bed with Boeing. She is, you cannot trust anything she tells you from, I think she's very smart when it comes to world from uh, foreign policy. However, that foreign policy is 100% molded by her experience and by who's lining her pockets. I don't trust her at all. Um, 
I trust DeSantis more than I trust her, um, but I, tr- I trust Trump more than I trust any of them, and that's who I'll vote for if, I, if given the chance. If I don't get the chance to vote for Trump, that's a powder keg in its own. If we go to, so Maine just announced, or it came out that uh, Maine has now kicked Trump out of the out of the primary, and we'll, that'll end up going to the Supreme Court. And I don't think I don't think any of these uh, liberal states will be allowed to keep him off the ballot. I don't think. But if they do, that's a whole new can of worms worms for this country. Uh, I don't know where that goes, but if I don't get the chance to vote for him, I would vote for uh, Vivek or for uh, or for DeSantis before mm-hmm. I would vote for the rest of them. And Chris Christie, I don't even know why. Why is Chris Christie still in the race? Mm-hmm. I don't, is he is he still in the race? I don't even I, know if he's I still in it. Or not. I don't know, but yeah, he needs to get out. He's not. But Nikki Haley, I mean, she's one hundred percent bought and paid for. So. Uh, yeah, I guess that's where we that's where we stand. Yeah, I, like I said, either either of those candidates, Vivek, DeSantis, Trump, I'd like Trump out of all of them, but I think no matter what, those three, if one of them gets elected, we can change shit. Or we can change the tide. We can turn things around. And I also just want to throw out there, you know, I know that we might have some conservative views and kind of what we were talking about when people were giving us hate about having DeSantis on this podcast. Yes, most of our views are probably conservative, but like I'm not all 100% Republican. I'm not all 100% liberal. I'm not all 100% love everything that comes out of Trump's mouth. I'm not all against everything that comes out of DeSantis's mouth or, or whoever, right? And when you look around the landscape of social media, it seems like everybody's all or nothing. You're either all somebody or all one party or nothing. And that's just bullshit. I'm a pro freedom person. I, I want America to keep what is the, the freedom that we've been able to enjoy for so long and keep that intact. So our kids, my kids can enjoy that, you know, and we can enjoy that. And I just, I just want to keep this country intact and keep it to continue to be a great nation. And I just feel like where we're going, it's going against that. And so um, I hate the two-party system, but at the end of the day, it's it's the choice that we that we have. And you almost have to choose the, the, the lesser of two evils, you know, essentially. And I think right now in our best interest as Americans, it just feels like the Republican Party is that, yeah. you know, but... Just wanted to throw that out there. I know a lot of times we talk a lot about we're you know we have conservative views, but we're not 100% Republican conservative to the absolute max. I mean, there's some stuff that you could say. Well, you're kind of dad likes Tesla, right? You know, like yep. there's shit that you know that makes us makes us all us, right? And it's okay to be have a few topics on the left, have a few topics on the right. I think that's most people, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I think a good example is that you in that bit with DeSantis, he talked about the EV, uh, and you know, he's he's kind of he kind of made the mention that he's like anti EV, and we're, you know, we're pretty. I, I think we all are in our family. I mean, uh, Sawyer's brother's got a Tesla. Sawyer's girlfriend's got a Tesla, um, and I'm I love Tesla. And the other thing I thought that was interesting is we asked him a little bit about. Um, the carbon, the whole carbon market, and he took that to ESG scores and all that. Well, you know, we're we're starting a project where we're basically sequestering carbon. We're using it to to separate our manure, and that's for a whole nother day. But it's so interesting because we are definitely not one candidate people, but we're we're not even one party people. I'd say we're we're pro freedom above everything else and we're pro business like our my goal in life or what I don't know if my goal in life but what I love about this country is you can find ways that whatever you do you're not capped you're not you're not stuck where somebody's telling you well that's it you're going to make this much you're going to this is you can't do any better than this. And we don't want that for anybody. We think that if you want to work, if you want to work hard enough and you want to and you want to learn 
you should be able to go as far as you can take yourself. And I mean, I guess that's why we're probably conservative is because we believe more in personal responsibility, but also personal opportunity. Mm -hmm. So thousand percent. I'd, I'd be on my bus. Yeah. Personal opportunity, personal responsibility. There you go. Discipline. Torque for mayor. Torque for mayor. <laughs> All right. Oh. Uh, we'll get, we'll throw it. We'll do an ad question. Uh, so Thomas emailed us and he asked if we had any thoughts on additional ideas or ventures that we should explore as cattle producers to grow their operation and increase revenue, or do you have any ideas that could help him grow his freezer beef business? Oh, you know anything about that? Yeah, I'm, I know what you mean. I, I know a little bit. I don't know a lot, but I know a little bit because we're going down that road a little bit here. Um, I, it's, I mean, the obvious answer is, well, just create your own market for your beef, right? And it sounds like you're kind of already starting to do that. And I think that is ultimately the route I would go if I was you. Um, I'd build a brand. I would market. I would get, try to get your own market established because playing the commodity game, as we all know as farmers, is it's getting harder and harder to play that game. And I think for the for the future, it's gonna it's gonna be it's just gonna get harder. And so, if you can find a way to create your own market and market your own product, you can be ahead of the competition and hopefully hopefully stay in that the ag business, stay keep your family farm alive. Um, and you know, as as you guys know, we're trying to do something similar. So, I mean, there's all kinds of products. You know, beef tallow. People are getting into, you know liver and all this shit that you could you could try marketing but i think ultimately you you grow an animal and you have an opportunity to sell something that not a lot of people get the opportunity to sell which is beef and i think that um yeah you just really got to you got to you got to find your your what makes you different uh and you have to constantly be learning and and evolving on how you can um, differentiate yourself, how you can market, how you can get more eyeballs on your product. I mean, just grind social media. Um, look, I mean, just you gotta, you gotta research because what you don't know that you don't know is what's going to hurt you the most. Look around, look at other meat businesses, look at other direct to consumer beef businesses, look at other ranches that are doing this. Look at the website, look what makes them different. What are they doing? That's you you know, like compare shit because that's probably the the thing that I do more than anything is I am constantly looking not only in our own industry for ideas on how to make things better in our own stuff. I'm also looking outside of our industry. I'm looking into fitness. I'm looking in, at all in every brand that I can get my eyes on and see what what Shopify app are they use? Are they using Shopify? What's their checkout page looks like? What's their add to cart page look like? Uh, you know, all that stuff will give you so many ideas and it will allow you to see who's doing shit at a high level and who's not and figure out how you can do shit at a high level. Because as you do that research and look around the landscape, there's a lot of people that do this shit and they do it at, just to be honest with you, at a mediocre level. They they like the idea of doing the direct-to-consumer beef business and, or meat business in general in general and they they get the store up and they and but you go look at the website and product pictures aren't great website doesn't look great doesn't work the conversion well. the, the conversion how fast it takes somebody to add it to the cart check out all that can do, do they do add do they do add-ons do they do upsells do they i mean all that stuff matters and you you can really see who's out who's doing the shit on a high level and who's not and so you really have to immerse yourself in that and really just look around and just absorb as much information and feedback as you possibly can to make your stuff better. It's not only the website, it's how you can fulfill orders faster. It's how can you market your beef and get more eyeballs on it. I mean, there's a million things that you can look and go down rabbit holes for, but all of it matters and um, all of it will pay off if you just continue to, to look for those answers. I mean, that's what I've done. And it's, it's gotten, it's worked well so far. And I, and I'm, 
I'm not saying we do shit at an extraordinarily high level, but like, I feel like we've got a good website and I feel like our conversion rate's pretty good and we're getting better at the fulfillment center every time that we pack orders and, um, I'm just getting more efficient and I'm learning these new apps and stuff to help me run the beef business or, or the meat business better. And it's just, it's just a constant learning curve and a constant seeking of information to get better. And I, I, I guess that's my two cents on how you can run your beef business better. And I really don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't know any more ideas for you that you could, that has directly to do with cattle, uh, you know, to increase revenue for your operation besides that. And I think ultimately the long-term play of creating your own market, that singular goal is going to pay dividends if you can make it work. So I would just say focus on making that side of your operation the best it possibly can be and get better at every level you possibly can on that business. And hopefully in the next five to 10 years, you have created your own market and you don't have to rely heavily on these packers to make a living and you can make a little bit more money for yourself. So long answer, but yeah, well, I like that. I think one thing that he may not be thinking about, and I, I think a lot of people that kind of do direct to consumer maybe don't put enough emphasis on is it's not enough it is not enough to go through the hurdles of getting your beef processed and getting it labeled and getting it packaged and getting it to where you can ship it. I feel like like that's a lot because there's no nobody's going to help you do that. You have to figure that all out on your own. Um, but having the product available, I feel like that's even if it's the best product even if it is the best beef that anybody can get, I don't feel like that's 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 like not even half the battle because you have to get people that want to buy your product over somebody else's product, or just or just take the convenience of going to the grocery store and buying it there. So your brand, and you may not have a brand. And you may not have to go to the extent that we that we have here in the fact that we kind of have multiple brands. You know, we're doing the podcast, we're doing the farm channel, and we're doing the direct to the meat business, and they all kind of feed together. But you've got to find your why and you've got to document somewhat. Like you gotta do better than having a website where it goes there and there's a picture of you standing in the standing in the feedlot with a feed bucket saying these are our cows and we do a really good job taking care of them. Mm-hmm. People want more than that, but you're I think that's something that even people that have been doing this now for a while probably maybe don't realize as much as they should is the competition's coming. Well, I would say the competition of business is so it's it is at the highest level it's ever been because it's never been easier to get into business no matter what business it is and so you have got if you're going to do a business you can't half ass it you can i mean i don't know where you're trying to go with it but if you're trying to make it so you can be not relying on packing plants and you can market all your beef through your own network and your own market so you can make a really good living you have got i mean you have got to try your absolute hardest and go 100 percent at that goal because every there are so many other people trying to do it and there's so many other people that are doing it i don't know they're finding information left and right and new stuff comes out every day and new tools come out every day and the ones that get on it and learn it and get better and are trying to do it every single day are the ones that are going to win and the ones that don't might quit. It might not work out. They might not get it to the point that they want to get it to. And so I would say product matters. It's got to be a good product because that's, you, you don't want to be only marketing your product through advertising. And that's the only way you get customers. Cause you're just going to have to spend money constantly to get customers. You want some kind of referral. So you have to have a good product. The only way you get referrals is with a good product, 
But you also have to have, like Dad said, a brand. You have to get eyeballs on your your product for people to buy it to even get the product out the door. And so there's a million ways to do that. There's a million ways to get your product better. And there's a million ways to make all the techie shit on your website and all that stuff better. Um, but it's just you have to be willing to commit yourself to it and go all in on it. Like this, this idea of doing a, this as a side hustle, it, I just feel like the meat space is so competitive and, you know, all the ranchers and all the farms that are trying to do this, it, it's really competitive. And so you have got to put in more effort than the competition to really make something of yourself and really create a brand that stands the test of time. And so, um, that's, that's, that's my two cents. I know that was kind of a lot, a little ramble there, but, um, I hope that helps. And I really don't have any other ideas for you outside of that. Hey guys, if you're a livestock producer, you've got manure. Our partner has your solution. Livestock, water, and energy creates clean, recyclable water, carbon credits, and two solid byproducts, fertilizer and the salts, from processing manure in real time. They clean the manure, and we get clean, recyclable water back to the barn clean as a whistle. This process creates additional revenue streams for the livestock producer that they didn't have before. These guys are putting something together, and it's starting to smell like opportunity. Give them a shout at livestockwaterandenergy.com. And watch our journey with them. We've partnered with these guys. Check out our YouTube channel, This Will Do Farm, and follow the journey there. Now, let's get back to it. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Carl asks, who do you have your hog barns insured with? We just got dropped by our insurance company after 15 years. I have neighbors that are in the same boat. What the hell's going on? Yes, this, this is crazy. So, we're with you because uh, we just got dropped. We uh, about what, about a month and a half ago. Uh, so my insurance man, who I've had, I don't know, since not long after I built my first hog building, I think, so 10 years probably, um, 10 or 12 years. Um, and and I, I can just say, because it's, it's Secura. Secura is who we had our insurance with, and they're out of Wisconsin. And um, great company. And when we started with them, they had, I'd say, a lot better coverage because they spent the time to understand our industry and understand the buildings and, you know, great premium, all that. And we've never had a claim with them of any size. Uh, I think the only claim I've ever had with them was uh, when I tried to burn my garage down on a 4th of July weekend uh, with my barbecue grill. But that's, that's for another story. Anyway... They randomly just dropped us, and we're switching. And I can't, I can't honestly tell you, I can't remember who we're going with. Um, but we are. We've got, we've got insurance through somebody that we're going to start first of January. But I did not realize how big of an issue this is. So what this all comes back to is, within the hog industry, there has been some massive losses over the last five years. So if you're listening to us somewhere in the Midwest, you know uh, the derecho that came through Iowa a few years ago, and then uh, we had a bunch of straight line winds even this year uh, come through the state. But then on top of that, there's been some really large uh, units, sow units that either had uh, tornadoes or fires and the companies that were insuring them have taken huge losses and because of the weather in the upper Midwest insurance rates have gone up and continue to go up and my guy told me that basically we're to the point here in Iowa that if you know, if we have another year or two where we have weather patterns or straight line winds, tornadoes, derecho, whatever, our insurance could double from where it is. And my understanding is if you go just south of us, if you go to Missouri, uh, there's a lot of coverage down there 
Like you might not even be able to get coverage on certain kinds of buildings. But um, I was talking to a friend of mine that owns his own semi and he trucks, he trucks hogs. He hauls hogs every day. He goes to Missouri and pick up, picks up wieners and hauls them up here to uh, nurseries in Iowa and then goes back. He does that every day, I think five days a week. And he was with um, a regional insurance company here in Iowa. They dropped him. They dropped him and a whole bunch of guys that uh, do the same thing he does for the same integrator he does, they all got dropped. And the reason for that was because this insurance company was a mutual insurance company and the way their system worked, each each office, they were required to cover the first, I want to say $80,000 of any claim that they had and then anything on top of that, it was backstopped by the parent company by the mutual, the co-op like insurance. Okay, well, they were from over west of us. And when the derecho came, there was one, there was two different uh, offices. And each one of those offices had over a hundred claims because they insured so many ag businesses that went over $80,000. So they had to pay the first eighty thousand, and I think that number's right. It could have been fifty thousand, but it sticks in my mind that it was like eighty thousand. Okay, well you do the math on that. Not very many local insurance offices have anywhere near that amount of collateral bond, whatever. So it rolled back up to the parent company, and then they had multiple. They're heavily concentrated within the Midwest and a lot in Iowa. It nearly bankrupted them. So they had to go to their reinsurer, which that's like some big company like Nationwide or Chubb or somebody like that. And it all just rolls downhill. Well, my insurance company on my hog buildings, they're the same way. They were heavily exposed to the hog industry and their losses have been so great. They just said, we're done. They didn't care. Like they didn't rank anybody. Uh, they didn't say, okay, well you haven't had a claim, so we're going to keep you. They just said, we're getting out. We're not going to insure any hog buildings, whether you got a sow unit, you got a finisher, whether it's a 600, whether it's a 10,000, we don't care. We're out. And so now you're down to maybe there's, maybe there's six different players left that will actually insure uh, hog buildings. So one, I already know my rates are going up. And two, if you have a claim, uh, you probably better not turn it in unless it's just an absolute catastrophe because if you turn it in, you're probably going to get dropped. They might pay it, but then they're probably going to drop you. Um, and I think this is just a, a small window into what's going on across the nation um, there's, I've heard a lot of stories of people that own, um, vacation homes in Florida or people that own homes in Florida, that that's their primary residence. And they're going without like an hurricane insurance because one, they can't get it or two, they can't afford it. They're just to the point where, you know, they can't get it. And, um, you know, full disclaimer, ag insurance is, Ag insurance is damn expensive. We're a very small, you know, grain farming operation, but just to insure our size operation, we spend over $20,000 a year on insurance. And I'm sure, you know, that's a number. When you when I talk to somebody that, you know, lives in town and has a house, if I tell them, you know, that's what my insurance bill is, they their eyes bulge a little bit, but you know, I know guys that, so I used to work for a large integrator. You want to see an insurance premium, try insuring like 50 or 60,000 sows and all the buildings and all the trucks and the feed mill and all the semis. You're talking millions of dollars to insure that. And uh, 
This insurance thing is just crazy. So I don't know if that gave you any answers, but what's going on is the insurance companies aren't making any money, um, and the risk, they're just getting out of the markets that they think uh, have the biggest opportunity to have a loss, and they just don't want to insure them anymore. So I don't know. Nope. I've been trying to get Sawyer to come up with a way to make you know a million dollars that we could just be self insured, but <laughs> still working it's on slow that. coming. Still working on that plan. Still working on that. I'll let you know once I get there, though. All right, I'll, I'll be sure. You'll be the first call I'll make. <laughs> uh, so we're on the topic of insurance, and this really isn't a question, but it's kind of a clarification because we kind of messed this one up on our last Q and A. Somebody asked us about specialty crops, um, and we said that. You couldn't get any crop insurance on that, and knowing us, we should have we should have known that. But we don't have any much experience with that. But right. we were wrong, and uh, you can you can get ins- get insurance crop insurance on those specialty crops, and they are classified as Category C crops, and are insurable under a written policy. Do you want to go more in depth on yeah. that since you're on the topic? So yeah, somebody asked us about you know getting in diversifying, and we just said that for us. We don't have any experience with that. And if you're going to like try to start from scratch, you put all that money out there. You know, we can insure, we can insure a certain level on our corn and beans where if we want to hedge our input costs, you pay something for it, but you can get crop insurance. And I was like, I don't think you can get crop insurance on blueberries or whatever. And um, this guy, He actually is a crop adjuster from out west, and he let me know that you can. Um, What it comes down to is you have to go to your your crop insurance provider, and they can write you what they call a written policy, which is basically a custom policy where they, they reach out to somebody that in some area of the country excuse me, that does do those crops and they write it specifically for your, for what you're doing. And generally it's not necessarily a lot more expensive. Um, it might be a little more expensive than what somebody, you know, if you, if you live somewhere out West that you're in an area that they grow potatoes all the time, um, crop insurance out there for those crops is probably standard like it is here for us growing corn and soybeans. But if I wanted to grow some specialty potato, I could probably get insurance for it under one of those written policies. It would be a custom policy and it'd probably be comparable to what they're doing, although it could be a little bit more expensive because um, maybe the weather conditions here aren't ideal compared to where they are there. But we just wanted to clarify that because, uh, you know, ignorance is bliss and we don't have any experience with it. And um, we fuck it, up too sometimes. It was probably a deal where Torque was running off of the mouth and just said, oh, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. But probably. you can. So yeah. we make everybody makes mistakes. Everybody does sometimes Every, uh, twice. Everybody has those days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so right. we're not perfect right. by any means. But so uh, I think. I think that's our. I think that's our last, our last one. Um, I think what I wanted to know now is, you could probably answer this better for me, better than me. Just, well, obviously there were lessons that I had to learn in twenty three, but I think because of everything that you started, what is your, as you look back, what is some of the, the best, or hardest, or whatever lessons that you learned in 23 yeah since we're on coming since we are into the new year we we wanted to do some some reflecting and some goal setting and some other stuff before we wrap up the show but um i would say we've said it once on the show before biggest lesson is don't be afraid to ask um there are people out there that can help you and having hard conversations, yes, is uncomfortable, but I think we tend to get in our heads a lot about hard conversations and asking people for something or asking guidance or asking for um, consulting call or whatever, but 
you would be surprised at the amount of people that actually are willing to give you knowledge and want to see you win. Um, and that's, that's something that I had to learn because, you know, it's just, I think you build that up. And especially when you're online and you're on social media, you look at just all the cynical people out there in the world. Sometimes it's, it's hard to, to escape that reality and like have the gumption to ask people for, for something if, if you need their help or guidance on something. I mean, I had some amazing people that helped me on my journey to start in this direct consumer meat business. Um, you know, other business owners that are in the space, uh, the people from Milo Locker giving me a chance and answering questions for me. And my, uh, my box lady out of New York city, she answering questions on boxes and liners and just asking the right questions. And, and as I went down that path of talking to more people and asking more questions and looking stupid, I realize you just gain more confidence of just not being afraid to ask questions. And that's the only way you're going to learn. I mean, you're going to learn from failing and other people helping you out and teaching you and, and guiding you. Um, and hopefully you don't repeat the same mistakes that they made. Um, and it kind of speeds up your learning curve a little bit. So that would definitely be my number one lesson learned. I would also just say, um, I'm learning pretty easy. I'm learning pretty quickly that balance it, uh, is one of those things that everybody likes to portray on social media. That everything's great and you're ripped and your your family's all great and your business is all great and your your work life balance is all great and it's just all great. But what I'm coming to realize is you're always going to feel imbalanced in one area or another inside your life. You know whether it be you're doing really good at home and you have a family and you, and you feel like you're, you're there with them and enjoying life and you feel like you're doing pretty good on in, inside your own business or, or at your career, but your physique and your fitness goals are really lacking or you're not cleaning, you're not cleaning your spaces up very good around the house and your wife's getting on your ass for it. You know, those are the kind of things that I'm quickly realizing you can't, you can't, you can't do it all, man. You can't be Superman and, and it's a, it's okay to come to terms with that. And I think uh, going through seasons of life where you change up your approach to life needs to be more normalized. Like when we were getting the meat business started, I did not spend as much time with Kat as I probably wanted to. And she probably didn't she probably was letting she was letting me know, hey, you know, like we need to go do some more stuff because like I know you're really busy and she's very understanding and she's supported me through the everything. But I'm just saying like, it's very easy to get caught up in the idea of, well, gosh, that guy has it all. That guy looks so great. That guy, he's so balanced. Everything's perfect in his life. But I'm just going to tell you, it, that's, that's a bunch of bullshit. You're always going to be imbalanced and you're always going to have to have compromises and you're going to have to have seasons of life where, you have to focus a lot on your business or a lot in your career and you might be lacking at home, but then you might have to switch that up halfway through the year or a quarter way through the year and say, you know what? I've been giving a lot of time to my business. I need to let off the gas pedal a little bit and I need to, I need to be a better dad or a better, better, better father. Or maybe it's, you know, years at a time. Like it, it's, it's personal for whoever, whoever's design or your life. I mean, you design those seasons, but um, this idea that you're going to have it balanced hundred percent of the time, I just think is, is bullshit. It's, it's an impl implication of just social media, I think. So I'm quickly realizing that as well, that, and the last thing I would say is, and I've said it before, um, the game of entrepreneurship is, is really glamorized nowadays, but you are going to quickly realize you're really going to have to want it if you really want to have your own business because it demands a fuckload of you. It demands a lot. And you have got to be willing to, to get up every day and be accountable to yourself and to give you everything you got to that business um, to make it work. And, you know, it's it's not as easy as everybody wants to tell you what it is. And if, if there are people out there telling you that it's so easy and get rich quick, they haven't really built anything. They haven't built something super, me very meaningful, I would say. You know, 
guys that have built real shit, real companies that are lasting and that have a big impact on people and society as a whole, uh, they'll tell you it's fucking hard. It's hard. It's we're going to require everything that you got, but it's very rewarding. And I would 1000% agree with that. And I'm no expert at all at business. I am learning shit every day. I, I have so much to learn, so much to accomplish, so much more to go after. But just in my first year, not even a full first year of doing it, I can tell you it requires a lot. And you have to be willing to take the beating that it, that it requires. And that's the price you have to pay to get the life that all these guys portray on social media that entrepreneurship is, right? That's the price you have to pay. And you can't have it both ways. You're either going to pay the price of sacrifice and bettering yourself or going all in in your business, or you're going to pay the sacrifice of not doing that and not ending up where you quote unquote want to be, right? So uh, those are my lessons. What are your lessons of 2023? <clears throat> well, so you and I are kind of in two different spots in life. That's 100%. what that's what makes it good, though. Yeah, that's what makes this podcast special. So Sawyer is he's got his foot uh, firmly planted on the gas, and he is going, and I love it. Uh, it exhausts me sometimes. And then I, <laughs> anytime given the chance, uh, I'm trying to coast, uh, because what I see is, uh, my dad used to say this, we would have these, we would talk about, um, something would come up or just random and we would start talking about, you know, his childhood and, and growing up. And then that would end up leading to a lot of times we talked about the war and when he was flying. And he genuinely loved the time that he spent uh, in the Air Force. But he would tell, you know, a story about this or that. And then he would look at me and he would say to me that that all seems kind of like a dream when he thinks back and then he would say many times he would say he would say to me a uh, lifetime is not very long so you better uh you better enjoy each part of it and so i have really started to try to focus on enjoying what i'm doing and when we're all stressed out, which we get stressed out a lot because some days there's <laughs> so much shit going on that, you know, well, Sawyer's got to be at farmer grade because the ice guy's coming or the box guy's coming or he's got to meet this or that or he's got to call about this or talk to whoever. And, you know, the pigs all have to get chored and the pigs are sick and you're thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go over there today and... Uh, who knows what I'm going to find. And it's hard to get fired up for that. And then uh, my other son uh, calls and somebody trashed one of the apartments at, you know, one of the fourplexes they have. And can we come bring the trailer and help out with that? And you just want to like, like literally you got to stop and breathe. And I used to get really stressed out about that. And I still sometimes do, but it's just a day. And I'm just thankful that I get to do what I do with family. And even though sometimes we get on each other's nerves, I think about all the time that I spent working for somebody else, which I'm thankful that I was able to do that because in that time of my life, I really needed that job to provide for my family. But I think about that today and there's a little there's a little tinge of regret and I hate to say that because I shouldn't regret it because I learned so much from what I was doing. But when I think about what we've done in just the last, if I think about what we've done in the last year, sometimes I think to myself, self, 
man, think of how much shit we could have gotten done if we would have started this sooner, like if we would have done. But you can't do that because it all it all happened at the time it should have happened. Um, and Happens for a reason. Yeah, and you got to enjoy it. You really got to find a way to enjoy every day. And um, 23 to me was just like really eye-opening. And the last thing I'll say about it is if I had to, if I had to pick one thing that I really kind of took to heart, it was this idea that in our minds, we see people that run companies on, you know, a national scale or a world scale, but we also see people that run companies in our own little town or do whatever. And we kind of put those people on a pedestal and we think that, you know, man, they're just, they are executing and they are so smart and they are so good. And you know what? Dealing with the people that we've dealt with in 23 and all the stuff that we're doing, it's just like the DeSantis campaign. Those people were great people. Every one of them that we dealt with a great person. But <laughs> when you meet them, you're, you're, they're just regular people. Mm -hmm. They're just regular people, and they're all dealing with the exact same crap that we are as in trying to figure out that balance. They all have that same they all have that same tension as to like, you know, well, what should you know, like you can almost feel it. Um, you know, they all have a job, but they're torn like, is this what I should be doing? Am I doing this right? They all have the same inner inner talk that we have doesn't matter how big the numbers are that they're running through whatever they're doing they are just like you and me and when you realize that it makes it it really makes it easier like when i have when i go to email somebody or i go to call somebody from some you know whatever whether it's a pr for, firm or whether it's a whether it's somebody's political campaign I don't get near as stressed out as what I did, you know, even two years ago, because you just realize that we're all in this deal together and we're all trying to figure it out. And every you just, yeah, everybody's got shit. Everybody does. But it's also very powerful when you realize that, that really successful people are no different than most yeah. of us. I mean, there are exceptions. There are the Elon Musks of the world that are fucking geniuses right out the womb. Yeah. Right. There's LeBron James that is a God gifted, amazing athlete. Right. Yep. Patrick Mahomes can throw a football like nobody else. Aaron Rodgers, whatever. But most people, most successful people, if you sit down and you talk to them, most of them are regular people. Yep. And that's powerful because every single one of you, every single one of us has that same power in us if you just go after it and go get it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, and I've said this before on the show, that is the most powerful thing that social media has ever given me personally is it has shown me what is truly possible, what the average person can achieve if they just, Resil you know, just push through and grind it out and don't quit, you know, and learn from your mistakes. Like that can get you really far. Cause like I am not, I will be the first to tell you, and you can ask anybody that if you ever come across somebody that knows me, I am not the smartest cat. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm not, I don't, I've never had that title. I never will have that title. And that's okay. Like, but I'm, I'm going to go after it resent, resilient. I'm going to go after it relentlessly because I've seen that that is, that's a recipe for success for most people. So, uh, yeah, that's good. I, I agree with that. What are your, what are your goals for 24? You got any goals? Yep. Uh, my goal for 24 is get all the shit done that I didn't get done in 23. It's a good one. <laughs> it's a real uh, good one. No. So, um, I think, my number one goal for 24 is to separate manure. Uh, our, for the farm, for me personally on this farm, I want to get the manure separation deal figured out and 
I want to have a pile of dry manure sitting there come fall. I do not want to drag line manure fall of 24. So that's that's going to be when that when we finally start construction and we're we're very close on on starting it. Um, it's like any new technology. There's just a so much stuff that has to be figured out. Um, even on the ground floor to get going. Um, and I think for all of us that's involved in it, it's taken longer than what we thought, but it's going to be so worth it in the end. I believe it will be. I think it could change our industry. Um, I think it could really change the conversation uh, in production agriculture when it comes to both cattle and hogs and dairy. Um, so that's very important to me. That's what I'm that's what I really want to work on. Um, and then uh, on top of that, just keep trying to do better at this because I'll, you may not all realize this. So, you know, we're, you guys consume this content and I think there's this idea that we create this stuff and you consume it and we, our goal is to give you value, but I really feel like what we get out of it is so much greater because the amount of things that we've learned and the opportunities that we've had and the people that we've met that make us better because of Barn Talk podcast, I don't, you can't put a price on it. So, um, we're going to keep working on the barn. We're going to keep working on trying to get better as far as being organized and consistent and just put out a good product. I think those are the two things that I want to work on the most is Barn Talk Podcast and Dry Manure. I like it. How about you? Those are on my list as well. I, it's funny, me and Kat actually had our coffee this morning. We I got a big whiteboard just sitting in my sitting in the office at our house and um we we went and listed out our goals today for both of us individually and then us together. And um, I would agree on the on the manure separation. Definitely want to get that done. It's going to be a big focus for us this year, or for, yeah, this year. Um, and Barn Talk, you know, same deal. I want, to, I want to make the experience here for guests better, the experience for you guys better, get as better guests on, get bigger guests on, um, and just provide as much value as we possibly can, but also, you know, feel like you have to have a metric to see to see the success. So I'd love to get our YouTube. I mean, shit, we grew to 189,000 subscribers on YouTube. Shit, I'd say we could try to hit double that, go for 350 maybe in 2024. Uh, and I'd also love to get our listenership per episode to. 50k listens per episode i thought th i think that would be awesome um just yeah because we love hearing from you guys and we love sharing this sharing this out with you guys and we love seeing the seeing it grow and so i feel like you got to have metrics to measure the success on so those are my metrics of success for barn talk but honestly if we just keep making things better i think that will come so yeah. i and if we didn't hit it it's not the end of the world to me because I love doing it. So yeah. we and I don't plan on stopping it. So that's that's the thing. Um, and then for this, we'll do farm. Want to continue to grow all that stuff. Keep showing our journey as farmers uh, to everybody. And for farmer grade, I'd love to. I'd love to two x our revenue, three x our revenue in twenty twenty four. We are only in business for seven months in twenty twenty three, and um, I'm pretty happy with where we got the first year, but. This next year, I'd really like to double or triple that, and I'd love to get my first first hire, hire on our first team member at Farmer Grade and help uh, lighten the load on my shoulders a little bit. But just keep just keep pushing that out and providing a, a quality product to people um, is, is a big thing for me too. So, um, And I'd love to go to the gym and have a good physique and have a good life and, you know, really strive for that balance, you know, that everybody likes to portray, but, uh, I know that it's going to come, there's going to be seasons this year that we're just going to have to go through. So we'll get there. Hey, yeah. Uh, I'll share this since you talked about the gym, uh, for all of you out there that are of, you know, I'm 52 and, 
everybody in my family was worried about me because uh, I don't go to the doctor much. Uh, <laughs> I just, for no, not any reason, I'm not scared to go on the doctor. Just, I don't, well, for one reason, every time I go to the doctor, there's always a bunch of sick people there, and I hate being there because I'm like, I try to hold my breath as long as I can. But anyway, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to the doctor. So I went to the doctor and uh, checked out really well. Uh, my prostate is nice and smooth. I was just going to say, I, th- I think you're just afraid of that finger going up your ass. Nice and smooth. And so <laughs> me and my uh, family doctor now, we have a special head nod when we see each other because we had a moment together and uh, that was great. Uh, but uh, I'm, in, I'm in good shape other than my blood pressure is a little too high. And uh, not bad, but it's a little high. So I'm going to try to lose about 30 pounds. I'm, I'm a little bit lighter than I was. I never had a scale. I still don't have a scale. I just go off of the notches on my belt. And my belt, I'm on the furthest notch that I've been on the belts that I own. I don't know how old they are. But I need to lose. I could lose 30 pounds pretty easy. And I think if I lose that, that'll take care of my blood pressure. And everybody in my family had really good ideas as to what should be. And I don't know. None of them gave me, none of them gave me bourbon as a, I mean, I feel like anytime I have a, a nice glass of bourbon or an old fashioned, my blood pressure just drops, but none of them suggested that. So we'll see whether or not, uh, all that works, but yeah, that's your health update for torque in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> we'll check back next year in 24 and tell you whether I accomplished all that. Yeah. Um, I would say for any of you, the last thing on the goals is, any of you out there, if you got something that you want to strive for this year, start today. Yeah. Start today. Go after it because nobody's coming and the best time to start is today. And um don't try to don't try to start a million habits all at once. Try to start one thing, get that habit. Then start another habit once you get that one down for at least, I don't know. Don't try to, because I, I get in this state where I try to do all these things all at once and I never end up, I don't stay consistent with any of them. So I found that doing one thing, sticking to that thing, getting that established as a habit, then moving on and maybe trying to add another habit onto your tool belt is a better way of going about it. But I would just say nobody's coming to save you. Nobody's coming to help you on your journey of what you want to accomplish in this life. It's all on your shoulders. It's your responsibility. And the only way you're going to change things for the better is in yourself. Find it in yourself. So um, just just go after it. The information's out there. All the successful people out there, most successful people out there are just like you and I. They're no different. You got the power in you to do whatever you want to set your mind to. And I know that's cheesy and that's corny or whatever, but it's truth. I mean, there's limitations. Obviously, you can't, not all of us can be LeBron James. But if you want to make a little bit more money, you want to look a little better in the mirror when you're looking at yourself, you want to be smarter, you can do all those things every day, a little bit every day, and you can, you can achieve those things. So it's all in you. You just got to go get it. And don't, don't wait another year. Don't get to this time next year and be like, shit, I wish I would have done that. Another year goes by and you don't, you don't feel fulfilled. You don't feel like you accomplished anything. That's a shitty feeling. Um, so just start and go after it. And one day at a time, man. Yep. One day at a time. So. Yep, and when you mess up, uh, get up the next day and start over. Don't be one of these people that... So there's some of us that are all or nothing, you know, that they're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this diet or I'm going to get on the treadmill or I'm going to whatever. I'm going to read so many pages and then you miss one day and you're like, nope, done. You're, you're an all or nothing kind of person. Don't let that stop you because I've fallen off the horse on so many things that I've done. But I, this year I feel better. I feel more than ever that I've done a better job of getting back on the horse and not just pouting and feeling sorry for myself. And you really got to figure out what like what works for you so like one thing for me is i'm like a visual person so something that i love is having like i love having a calendar every one of the hog buildings has a calendar in it i have a big ass calendar in my um basement 
and I like to have everything laid out that I've got to do that I know I have to do and then the, my goals I like to have that so it's like staring me in the face and that works for me some people don't need that some people they internalize it they're good I'm not one of those people but when I see it I go hmm, yeah I better get it back on that and you just got to find what works for you and to your point like just don't don't try to eat don't try to roll up that pizza and eat it in one chunk like you just got to take a little bit at a time and you know what you change one thing every day and go and then you add one more thing you can you can accomplish a lot one day you know every day you just try to do a little better than you did the day before and if you screw up start again Mm -hmm. Start again, my friend. Start again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last thing before we get to the whiskey minute that I just wanted to say, um, I think we all know that 2024 is a oh, yeah. is a big year in a lot of ways, but it's an election year. Um, and so all I want to say is on your journey to greatness and, and going after what you want, there's going to be a lot of fucking distractions. I can almost guarantee you there's going to be a fuckload of distractions happening inside of our country. Uh, it, sometimes it's probably going to feel like the sky's falling down because that's what happens in an election year. They want to tell us, they want to divide us as much as they possibly can, especially more in an election year than, than other years, I feel like. If it's anything like 2020, I feel like that's what it'll be this year. And it'll be worse. It'll probably be worse. So just prepare yourself for that. And you can control what you got to control and realize also that the power is in our hands. And if we want to make the change, you got to go vote and you got to vote for the right candidate and you got to set the standard in your own community. This is a pivotal year for the, Amer for the American people and for this country. So really... Really think about the decision you're going to make when it comes to election time and really, really make sure you're not just reading the headline of all the shit that's going to be coming out because there's going to be shit on either side that's going to get blown out of proportion or I don't know. We just know that this, this if it's anything like 2020, it's going to be a fucking shit show and there's going to be a lot of shit going on. So just have your, have some filters on. Don't be so blinded. Read into some stuff more. Do some, do more research than the average person does just reading the headline and like really analyze shit because I, there's going to be a lot of stuff I feel like. So that's, that's just my prediction. That's just my opinion, but um, continue on your path of making yourself better, but just realize this is a pivotal year. I feel like for, for America. When we say do your own research, this is a, if there's been a year to do your own research, do your own research because there's going to be so much crap thrown out there that you're going to hear about and this and that. You got to do your own digging and you got to know it for yourself. And yeah, just don't got to stay strong. Take, don't take everything at the surface level. Yep. Really know who's telling you what they're telling you. And why and who's paying them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Run it through. <laughs> Run it through. Analyze it. Run it through a filter. Don't just take everything that they say at face value. Really make sure that they're that if you believe what they're saying, that you damn well figure out that that's true or that's not. So that doesn't, I don't care who it is. Run it through a filter. We got to do more of that shit. So right. anyway, all right. Last thing, Whiskey Minute, what do you got for us here? We we have spent this entire episode trying to give people positive, uplifting advice, and now we're going to finish with bad habits. So today on the Whiskey Minute, I'm pretty excited for this. I have a bottle of Hirsch single barrel. And what's really awesome about this, so this is a little geeky, um, this is actually, what's in this bottle is mostly Willet product. So if you're familiar with Purple Top Willet, that is a, 
That is a very fine whiskey. That stuff is awesome. If you're ever somewhere that they have a bottle and they'll do you a pour and it's not outrageously expensive, I would recommend you get one because it's very good stuff. So Hirsch is, and I really love this bottle because it has the age statement on it. It has the mash bill on it. And earlier versions of this, older versions, were 100% Willet distillate. So they were barrels of Willet that they sold and Hirsch bought them and they bottled them, which is very surprising because a bottle of Willet will go well over $200. If you're like me and you live somewhere where you don't get an allocation of it, you're buying it on the secondary market, well, you ain't going to buy it because it's just too damn expensive. But nevertheless, it was mostly what I'd say is reject purple top, which still <laughs> much better than a lot of the whiskey out there. Um, but you have to be careful because on this bottle, it says distilled in Bardstown, Kentucky. But you can pick up a bottle that looks just like this. This is the double oaked. But you can pick up a bottle that says single barrel, and when you look on the side, it says distilled in Indiana. If it's distilled in Indiana, there's no Willet product in this. This is, uh, what, GPC or something like that, a huge, uh, a huge bourbon producer that's in Indiana. Uh, there's no Willet product in it. But this is 95% of it is eight years old, and 5% is three years old. The eight-year-old stuff is Willet. The five-year-old, the five percent, that's that's something else. But the older bottles were a hundred percent Willet. But anyway, just uh, it's great that they put that age statement and the mash bill on it. Um, but if you can find one of these bottles, and I picked this bottle up for I think about seventy bucks, which that's that's a good price. That's a damn good price. So we're and I haven't tried it. I've been saving it. Because I was like, when I found this, I was like, damn, I'm going to have that on the old barn talk. So I'm going to pour <laughs> myself a glass. I'm not giving you any. Not giving me any. Do you want some? A little. I'll okay. have a little. All right. You got to do a, a little pour for me. How's that? Uh, glass? That's fine. All right. <clears throat> so I'm pretty excited. Uh, I'd really like a bottle of uh, Purple Top. I might give myself just a hair more of that. I'm trying to hold this, not spill it, put the, put the bottle back down. So uh, it smells pretty good. Uh, should we cheers to Barn Talk? Cheers to Barn Talk. Cheers to, new, to the new year. Cheers to you, Kingpin. Cheers to you, Con El Conquistador. What do you think? <laughs> I haven't had whiskey in a while. <laughs> Sawyer's been <sighs> Sawyer's been uh, pretty dry for quite a while. Um, I'll tell you, I really like it. It's pretty good. Um, it definitely has slow burn. Well, it's got a. It's for I can't remember how many proof this is. Wasn't um, it? Wasn't it, it? Wasn't like stinging me right off the bat, but. It's that warmth coming down, running it's down my chest. It's proof. Mm. So, I mean, it's got a little zing to it. Yeah. But I would say that if you <clears throat> taste something like this, to me it tastes different than most of what I, well, pretty much anything that I drink. This actually has a little bit of, I don't have a very refined palate. I love these guys that do these these whiskey TikToks and all that that'll tell you, oh, I have this and that note and all that. The only thing I can say is, to me, it almost has a little bit of a berry uh, yeah, aftertaste. I would agree with that. that. You don't often you don't often taste like a lot of times you can get that sugary taste, which people say that's caramel or this or that. This almost has like a little bit of a cherry. It's damn good. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think you, on the back end you can kind of taste that. Yeah, I, I would describe it as berry. So I would say, here's the thing: if you can find a bottle of this and you're paying less than a hundred dollars for it, it's a bargain. If you can get if you can get the Bardstown that is Willet distillate, 
if you're if you look at that and it's uh, from Indiana, you don't want to pay what they're asking for it because it you can get that you can get that distillate uh, a lot cheaper somewhere else. But uh, for starting out of the gate in 2024, I'd say you know only up from here. Yeah, I so. I'd agree with that. I I liked it. All what right, would you rate not, it? What would you rate it? Oh, I would rate that. Uh, that's probably one of the better pours that I've had. Uh, on the show. On the show, definitely. I would put it right up there. I would. I'd give it. I'd probably give it a nine. A nine. Oh wow, that's. I mean, to me, good. I think the best. I'll just say the the bottle that I had this year that I liked the best was that. I had a bottle, it was a store, I think it was a store pick, and it was a 12-year-old uh, Knob Creek, and that was damn good. I, I that Well, that bottle's gone. <laughs> um, that was, it just, that, that flavor and the way it tastes, I really liked it. But I would say, I would say this is, I like this better than I like that, so... I, it's the best whiskey I've had on the on Barn Talk. All right, well, how's that for finish? That's so there that's you go. finishing up the year and starting out guns blazing. There you go. I love it. All right, guys. Well, that's gonna wrap it up. If you got any value from the show, please share it out. Share it out with your friends, family, whoever. Pay the fee. Uh, leave a review on Spotify or Apple. You can submit your questions at and email them to us at barntalkshow at gmail dot com to have them answered on the show like we did here today. Um, go after what you want this year. Put yourself first. Um, and we'll see you back here next week for another episode. Uh-huh.